from Puerto Rico, season two, episode eight. Hey everyone, um, we are so excited to be um, talking to you from Puerto Rico. Um, uh, we needed to get away. <laughs> I came here to do a little work um, and also to visit family. And, and I'm the carry-on package. <laughs> <laughs> and Joaquin. Joaquin's upstairs right now. Um, we've been here and we plan on coming to Puerto Rico a lot uh, more often to do some healing work down here and, and to just get involved in what's happening in Puerto Rico, uh, just be more close to our family and just be on the ground. So we're really excited about that. Yes. Um, yeah, and this trip has been lovely and also hard because I've been having some massive migraines. So I've been trying to, you know, sift through that. And um, I know after, you know, Hurricane Maria, there you can still see that there are some issues that yeah. they're dealing with, like, um, and, um, we had a very interesting beginning of our trip. The first three days, we had no running water. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, we had to be really creative. I won't get into details, but yeah. we got pretty creative. But it was also like humbling because it was, it wasn't a, this reaction we had. It was like, damn, so many people have not gone with water or electricity for so long. And we, you know, we managed as we did in the past yeah. when things like this happen. Um, but it was just like, this is still happening and it's intense, but. I'm happy to be here and soak up just the energy and the love of the people doing beautiful, amazing, um, restorative and healing work here. I don't want to leave. I'm yeah, dreading it. <laughs> shout out to um, Circuito Queer. Circuito Queer. Yes, they brought me here and I got to talk at the University of Puerto Rico about gender, about gender fluidity um, as a uh, gender identity. Um, so that was awesome. Did some... Um, one on like uh, some work on talking about BDSM and the healing aspects of BDSM and just had some great connections here so um, so today we wanted to do two short topics we were thinking a lot about this and the first topic we want to talk about is since the holidays are coming up we don't really celebrate the holidays um, and so you know and some of them make me very angry <laughs> but no judgment some people do some people don't and i'm talking specifically about christmas and new years and all that um, but also that uh horrible 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 um holiday um the thing that people call thanksgiving um, we absolutely don't celebrate that uh but uh, we know that sometimes um when you're being a survivor going to see family um, can be really really hard whether you celebrate these things or not or have political ideas about these things or not um, it's always tough uh, and so we just w wanted to talk a little bit about that and then in the second um, topic we wanted to talk about telling the truth and that came up when I was talking to Aisha from the Just Beginnings Collaborative when she was uh, in the midst of um, organizing her co conference on From No to Love which was amazing it was in DC um, and uh, uh, we were talking about stuff and family and I said, you know, we're all liars. And she said, what do you mean? I said, as survivors, we're liars. We, we lie about what happened to us. We lie about the extent of the damage. Uh, we lie to uh, save other people's feelings despite our own. Um, sometimes we lie to ourselves, right? And so uh, thinking about the lies that we're embedded in, what does it look like to actually tell the truth? And I was thinking in the more context of like, how do you tell the truth to your children? But I think there's other ways we can think about it as well. Um, so here we go. Uh, first topic, um, the holidays um, and really, and, I, and even beyond the holidays, how do you navigate being with your family of origin um, as a survivor? Um, and really, especially if your family uh, does not acknowledge it, 
um, or the uh, harm doer or perpetrator is in the household or is known um, to everyone. Um, what kind of dynamics and stuff does that bring up? Um, yeah, and I know for me, um, I think it's harder now. Um, these last uh, couple of weeks, maybe months, I don't know. Months. I've been struggling a lot about uh, what it means to be an adult survivor of child sexual abuse um, because uh, I don't know, I think as a, as a, if I said I am a survivor of rape and sexual assault, um, I, I tend to believe that people see that as an immediate thing. Um, although sometimes people, you, you know, ask about time frame, but that more so happens with child sexual abuse, like because it happened as a child, it, there's this huge distance between being that child and the impact of that and being an adult, you know? But you know, that, it, that always like confuses me because people, when it comes to other things, they can see how something that happened as a child could affect you now. like. Oh, um, you were burned in a fire. Now you're always like afraid of being around flames, like, mm -hmm. or you saw a scary movie and now you're afraid of clowns or something. You know, right. like, so people could register that and be like, oh, that happened when you were a kid. But I mean, it was so traumatic for you that right. it still affects you now. But I think because the topic is so sensitive for people, they don't know how to navigate or how to bring it up or how to support. They just rather just avoid it altogether and be like oh it happened in the past you just let it go because yeah it's such a loaded conversation it loaded scary all of it um yeah and so it's a distancing of it right and so people kind of like you know just either get over it or it happened so long ago how could that still impact you and that's that's kind of what's happening with me right now um just the the miseducation or the misunderstanding of the outcomes of csa and so uh you know, I'm 48 now and it's affected me consistently throughout. Uh, of course, things shift, but it, it is very much still present in my life and um, as it will when I am 60 and 75 and so forth and so on. But um, right now, I think my family is having a really difficult time understanding the impact on me, one, and then how even to uh, navigate the feelings of knowing who it is and interacting with that person as well um and really just like about um right now what's happening it's just heartache you know just heartache so in these moments of holidays where people are expected to come together i think we all have some choices to make right one whew, can do we have to go and i say have to because i don't know everyone's situation I don't know what the family dynamics are. I don't know what your status is. I don't know. Um, so I cannot um, um, say, don't go, <laughs> right? Everybody has their choice. So um, if you have to go, then how do you navigate going in those spaces? And if, you, if you've ever thought about the option of actually saying no, because I actually never thought of that in this context, you know, like I've never thought of saying uh, no when family stuff comes up in terms of like it connecting to my CSA stuff. And I have always pushed through it in the past. Um, and so I think that's the first question. Can I say, do I wanna be there? What would I get out of it? Uh, would I be harmed from this? And sometimes whatever answer you pick, you might be harmed either way. Um, and is there a goal, right? Like, is there a goal? And, and I, I would say, you were saying before, like, a, a, you're having a support person, your, your buddy system or something, because that is a really difficult thing to navigate if you have to be there. Yeah, mm. someone that can help be a buffer or a deflector, if anything, or your spokesperson if you can't speak. Um, so I, I think that's definitely important, because I know, um, you know, now knowing what I know now and what I continue to learn as an adult, um, about you know your CSA and our family and just everything um, I know that I mean bef like before even I didn't really understand it I still was kind of like you know like advocating and stuff and making sure that nobody told this person about you anything like just anything where you were living what you were doing right. what you look like like anything mm -hmm. and then if they were trying to give me a message for you like I would just be like no 
um, sometimes dismissing something is because you just don't want to accept it, right? Like, so if you still behave in the same manner that you did before, you're not acknowledging that there's an issue. So I think some people do that either consciously or subconsciously, right? Um, and so buddy system is absolutely, if you are able to have one, and a buddy uh, can know what's going on, but they actually don't have to know everything. You could literally say, me and my family don't get along. Um, if this particular person tries to come up to me, can you be a buffer? If I text um, you SOS 911, right, right. that means we need to go or we find have an excuse, a, a eye contact. signal, you know, or something. And, and you say, if I give you the signal, that means we have to go. Like, you give an excuse that we need to go. So that is great. It's, a, it's an exit plan. It's a blocking plan, you know. And that person is really there to, ch you know, check up on you. And they don't have to know what it is, in fact, about. Um, yeah, and... I think if you're able to to prepare, sometimes asking questions um, to whoever is organizing the space, knowing when the harm doer is going to arrive, when they're planning to leave. I know that it was helpful for me to know the exact time that person was coming because yeah. I had to brace myself. I had to just get ready to see their face and to allow all of those feelings to rush in. Um, so sometimes if you can get that information, that's great. Or if you don't know that information, maybe be, uh, being in a space in the house or, or, or the space, yeah, a space in the house that um, is a way that you don't get to see the front door and your buffer person can let you know once that person arrives so that you can be ready and yeah. they can be with you. Um, another thing is having that buff buffer person be the one in front of you all the time so no one can come towards you without them in front of you. So it depends all on your family dynamic, you know, um, how, how people communicate with you and all that. But those are just some tips that I can think about in terms of having to share space um, with the harm doer um, and, and essentially, you know, bystanders. Um, um, so anything else? Well, I also, and I think in these instances, I was talking to Mandy as well, because I'm talking about it as a survivor, but then I was thinking, the, just like you said, we sometimes don't get to see our family as much as we want, and so when these uh, uh, opportunities come up, we go. So we see cousins that we haven't seen in months or years or anything like that. So in those instances, then what is a, what is a tip for someone doing prevention? You know, because this is the healing part. I am heal trying to do healing work for myself and take care of myself and create boundaries for myself but what is the prevention piece of that like going into seeing family some that you know a lot very well and then some that you don't know at all well mm -hmm. i know personally like in the last year we've met a lot of family who was, well earlier this year my grandmother from my father's side passed away so we went to the funeral and i saw people that I either haven't seen since I was a baby or just ever met at all. They've only seen me through pictures. So that was a big thing. And I know like everyone's like, oh my God, the baby, the baby, the baby. So like everybody wanted to pass him around and stuff, but I made sure that he was always within my eyesight. I was never too far away from him. Like if he was at one table, I was at the next table. And I was every like three minutes or so, I'm like making eye contact with him or I would walk up and be like, hey, baby, see if he's all right. And then go get something to eat, come back. So he was never alone for too long. And I never let anybody change his diaper. That's a big thing for me. Um, yeah. um, I know like like when I go visit mommy and stuff, I'm the only one who changes his diaper. I think Christina, my cousin, changes his diaper like once or twice if it's like overnight and she's watching him. But other than that, I don't really... I don't want too many people dealing with his diaper. Um, and also, if there's a harm doer that I've been made aware of, they're definitely not coming near him. Even if it's like, oh, well, this it was 40 years ago. Ew, I don't care. Right. I'm not letting, why would I want to introduce my son to this person? So, so then to, for me, I would take that another step further and connects to the episode we did about the protection plan, right? For me, it, even in retrospect, because even though I did this verbally with family members, in retrospect, I, you know, like writing this down, really thinking about um, what is it that you don't want people to do? Because often we don't say anything until it actually happens. You're like, oh, no, 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 don't do that because I don't want anybody doing that. Or I, I don't allow my child to do this or that. Rather than having to correct someone over and over and over, what, is, what about that protection plan? You know, so one of those things I would say is I am the only one that changes his diaper. Or if, you, if there's a designated person. Right, right. 
or if you know there's a harm to it there, you just say, I, I do not feel comfortable with my child being alone with and name said person. You don't have to say why, because it doesn't matter. Yeah, right? you're the parent. Right, so I don't feel comfortable with said person being alone with my child. Like, I really believe that you have to be absolutely specific because we make assumptions that everyone has the best interest at heart. And even if they do, it might not be the best interest that uh, equates with your own, right? It's, it can be very different. And then on top of that, that's a whole thing where people are like, oh, well, that's your aunt, that's your cousin, that's your this. And for me, that doesn't make any difference to me. Like, if you are somebody who's harmful and you're gonna, there's a possibility that you could hurt my child, I don't care who you are, you're not going near him. So that whole, oh, it's blood, doesn't mean shit to me. Also, it's like, uh, no one can spank my child. Oh, hell no. no. One, you know, so it's like really thinking it through and, you know, you don't, I don't, you don't necessarily have to like list 15 things down the line to someone but it's also good to just um, keep that in your mind because if you are interacting with that list and really keeping it fresh in your mind you're really thinking about all of the ways that your child interacts with people and if you continue to say things like oh it's family remember that child sexual abuse is perpetrated 90 percent of the time by family members or people we know in our communities exactly. so um, we need to be really thinking about these things and I would suggest if you have the privilege enough if you're able to if you have agency within your family depending on what the dynamic is you verbalize it um, loud you know like loudly to people um, talk, even whether it's in uh, individual conversations with people telling them oh I don't allow anyone to do this and I don't want that and I don't want this and actually having the repercussion you know like what would happen say if someone I don't know, decided to uh, let them hang out with the person you said no or to change their diaper, then what would that be? We always have to think about what that repercussion is because we're never prepared. And so if we don't take action, whatever that action is, then that says that this is okay. What I said doesn't matter because you can, you know, so we have to be advocates and, you know, and, and protect our children, right? So what could that look like if someone and it i guess it depends on the degree right if they're with the harm doer then that's a very uh big thing um if they um i don't know i can't even think of something much more smaller but something that you can say i told you that i did not want something that. about you know what they eat you know yeah. just little things like that it just shows a level of respect right. for your parents respect consent and all of these like i told you that i did not want my child to have that you gave it to them anyway um, I don't feel comfortable and so this means for me, you know, I don't think uh, you can take care of them or uh, I can't even think of anything right now. But well, so, I mean along those lines like I know when you said like, sometimes things come up and then you like react to it afterwards right. like for example, I um, We went to the family reunion not the little mini family reunion back in September mm -hmm. and one of my cousins was drunk and she picked up Joaquin and she kissed him on the mouth and I was like, no. Like, mm. it was just an immediate, like, don't ever, like, why would you do that? I was right. so upset. Cause I'm just like, why would you ever kiss somebody else's baby on the mouth? Like, I just, mm. no, it, it bothered me so much. And I'm like, I didn't think I had to say that. Cause I'm like, but, she has kids too. So I'm right, like, you wouldn't right. want anyone to kiss your kid in the mouth. Like, why would you do that? Exactly. I was so upset. But you said, uh, you know, like you would expect that everybody, so everybody has their different expectations. So I don't expect shit. I'm going to think about these things clearly and I'm going to verbalize them. And then if they come up, if I didn't think about them, I'm going to add that to that list because it's just good to see how things shift what you have to have extra protections for and then as they get older and have agency right because we're not protecting them to the point where we're isolating them we're protecting them and teaching them so that at some point they're able to have their own agency and speak and you know take care of themselves while we take care of them as well until they become adults right so that's the goal so yeah and thinking about that as a survivor think about what would be helpful for you um what would you want to happen what is the goal um, do you have someone that can be there as your friend, your buddy, your buffer? Um, do you have, um, uh, are you uh, able to say, yes, I can go or no, I do not want to go or I can't go. Um, and if you don't go, what do you do to take care of yourself in those moments where family members are all together and you're not there? Do you have chosen family? Do you have a healing ritual that you can do or write? Um, contemplate like there are many things that we can tap into to take care of ourselves and just you know change these patterns break the patterns and 
how do we prevent these things? So thinking about that prevention plan we did in last uh, one of the episodes and um, being very specific about how do we interact? What are the boundaries that we set in, in, in that um, prevention work? Uh, any last words? Um, no, we'll just go to the next topic. Okay. All right. Part two. Um, so this one was about, oh yeah, the line. The line. The line. I've been thinking a lot about that um, in, in uh, two, uh, several ways, you know, like lying, like I said, when we first started, like we lie about what happened to us because we're totally afraid. Um, we lie, you know, about the extent of the harm, these things, but also like, um, I was thinking about lying to our children, not, and I'm not talking about lying to our children in terms of uh, if we're survivors. Uh, lying to our children in terms of information and we could talk about that in terms of sex and human sexuality or just in general like because the, f the thing that the thing that's funny to me this is the thing that's funny to me when we think about how a lot of kids learn about sex aka through porn right or through even tv stuff like movies about romance and stuff like that all of the things that we learn it actually is based in a fantasy, right? I mean, some things are pulled from reality, but it's really based in fantasy. Um, uh, what is it, the storybook, you know, storybook romances and, and fairy tales, that's all fantasy. Pornography, for the most part, is fantasy, right? And um, we live in this fantasy bubble, which to me is like, we can, we can say, these are lies, <laughs> these are lies. And then we, from those lies, we have to construct what the truth is well but we have to construct our plan for our life right and realize that that was not the truth at all um and so where's the line between uh fantasy and reality and where do we stop with fantasy with our children where does it bleed into reality or do we omit fantasy altogether in terms of and i'm talking about like the tooth fairy uh, santa claus the easter bunny um talking about the reality around sex that you know we teach it usually in a heteronormative way and talk about it only in the context of love and procreation which is not the case uh it's not true at all um so you know how do we i think you should do like a, i think a like a mixture <clears throat> of maybe 80 percent truth 20 percent fantasy for certain things you know like certain things it's like yeah let the kids be kids let them enjoy thinking that there's this and there's that but then there's certain things that i wouldn't um let my let joaquin live in a fantasy life about especially in regards to like how we're living our lives so, like for example christmas we don't celebrate christmas right. so i'm not gonna put that thought in his head that there's santa claus and there's this and if you're a good boy and uh, so right, right. i don't want to i'm not gonna put that in his head the easter bunny we're not you know christian judeo or anything so we're not we don't need to learn anything about the easter bunny you know like certain things like that i can omit from having to do the white lies with him mm -hmm. but certain things like i might do the tooth fairy for a little bit but then he might just end up getting wise as he matures so some things mm -hmm. you don't have to like shatter their dreams like mm -hmm. sometimes they just figure it out or they just grow out of it or something but in regards to like sex and relationships and things like that i want to be 100 percent honest with him but i would choose different language mm -hmm. to um like so just to go with how he's developing because i mean i can't talk to him like he's a 29 year old who's experienced right, right. life so but i can still try to have common ground with him like not talk down to him just because he's a child mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and use little cutesy words like we're gonna use the proper name for body parts right right um i'm gonna explain to him that there are different types of bodies there's different ways to show this there's different mm -hmm. you know like and how sex is not equal love just all types of stuff that i want to teach him and be very honest about it because i want him like and that, that we discussed this before how like being honest and using the proper names for stuff that can help right. prevent things in the future because <clears throat> they have knowledge about their body parts and what's happening and if they don't like it and this is wrong and whatever 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 so i want that to be his experience i want right. him to be knowledgeable about himself about others and how to navigate because if he doesn't 
get like a real world view he's gonna move around in a way that he thinks is appropriate because of what he saw right, right. it reminds me of the um a law and order episode that i saw this kid um he was alone a lot his dad didn't really watch oh, him yes and he watched a lot a lot of porn and he was like what like 11, 11 or something yeah. and he ended up molesting a lot of kids mm -hmm. in his school and he was just like but i thought i thought they would like it and they were like but why and he was like, oh, well, in the videos, they say no, stop. But then they really do want it. Right, so right. I thought that, that they really wanted it. So he was in this fantasy and no one told him that that's not real, that this right. is a movie, that, you know, this is role playing. Sometimes people do say no, but they mean yes, but you have to have that consent prior. Like, right, you know, right. like he wasn't explained these things. So he went to school and forced kids to do stuff thinking right. this is how it's supposed to happen. So I'm definitely don't. I mean, that's an extreme case, but yeah, very, very. I don't want Joaquin to be like that and to be like, but I thought that, and I'll. I don't want him to have a harsh reality because he hurt somebody on accident or mm -hmm. hurts himself thinking that this is normal. You know, whatever it is he's yeah. doing. I'm. I'm actually trying to remember where that point was where you kind of grew up out of believing some of these things because. I do believe that, you know, fantasy is a beautiful thing and, you know, you that, I think that, that sparks creativity yeah. and all this stuff. And when you were little, I tell the story all the time that she um, walked in on me watching It, Stephen King's It. And she literally walked in when, like, the clown's face was like, ah, you know, all the teeth and everything. And she went screaming to her room. You were like four or something, three or four. And that was it she was terrified and she kept thinking that a monster was under her bed or in her room when it was time to go to sleep and the toilet so um i kept trying to ease her mind but she, there was nothing i could do and then finally i said i got it i bought this uh, monster spray and all you have to do is to spray it around and no monsters will come so i just got a, this bottle and i decorated it and i put water in it and every night i would come into the room and spray spray under the bed spray in the closet <laughs> it's very weird and you would watch me as i do it and then you felt so much you know comfortable and that helped for a little while but and in that moment i was like it was is that a lie or is it something to help you know like i don't know because it, in my um utopian mind i was like if i could do it all over again would i be a parent that just told the truth about everything and then i'd be like i wonder because i know that there are parents out there who do tell their kids the truth about something or, or specifically let's talk about jehovah's witnesses right and i practiced to be a jehovah's witness for many years um and um they don't celebrate um any of those things right so if a child is born into um that um religion they don't get to experience that and i remember all the kids that everybody has jokes about jehovah's witness kids right because they don't participate in the things that everyone else participates in so they're outcasts um and so do i want my kid to be an outcast in addition to you know all these other things um is it is it harsh where's the line i would love to hear from people if people want to respond to that because i was like where is that line because i don't know i actually don't know i think fantasy is fine but um when you said um you know we don't celebrate this so I don't have to tell them about that and i would take another stance on that I'll, and say well no uh, i would say and i think you would agree when i when i say this that um that i would talk about it that i would say this this is what some people celebrate yeah and in this country this is what other people celebrate and in here you know like it is just about giving information that is actually factual like this is happening people celebrate these things this is the origin of it i want to give information so that at some point, Joaquin can make his own decisions whether he wants to partake in Christmas holidays or not. Yeah. What you know, and so that to me that's really important because we're not we actually uh, funneling our children into like molding them into the idea of what we want them to be. Um, really, it is giving them as much as possible so they can mold um, you know whatever they want for themselves. And it makes me think about this, the documentary we saw on was it hulu yeah hulu uh far far from the tree i recommend that movie yes a uh, documentary uh far from the tree and it was uh literally about parents talking about um their experience and their journey as to like what happens when um you have a child That's that different. is completely different from you that uh, that um either did um through an illness an action that they did uh an idea that they have something um, that they are completely different than you and like how do you navigate that you know that was a very 
very interesting uh, documentary, so I uh, I recommend it, and it's a, a very diverse too, in, in terms of definitely not race, uh, but in terms of the, the type of children. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. For it's sure. not like what it's not just one box like what you think about. It's many different families where they have different kids and how they navigate their lives with their kids' differences. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. All right, and so what else? Yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. Like, really, I, for me, it's really thinking about how we share that information. Where is the line? Love to hear from you about that. Um, and I, I still can't remember where that shift came for you when you, like, kind of grew up and knew, like, that ah, um, that doesn't exist. That's for kids. Because and then there's this pl a thing that happens. Yeah, that thing that happens where it's like, it's like a rites of passage. Like, now I'm an older kid, so that's just for little kids. And, and it's accepted, really, right? It's accepted. The lie was totally accepted. But mm -hmm. it's a, a thing, so maybe it shouldn't. Be, maybe I, I'm calling it the wrong thing and saying it's a lie. But yeah, just a story. <laughs> a story. It's story. Uh, um, <laughs> Fairy tale. Yeah, but I, I'm also, um, you know, telling telling the truth in in general, um, especially when we're trying to talk to our children, relates back to like you know comprehensive or holistic sex, sexuality information. It's like the truth the truth right so talking about heterosexual uh romantic appropriative love is a, a tiny portion of that right um, and so uh we are um doing a disservice when we don't give uh, more information because when we do give all of that information and even in like when we give all that information we really allow for the best possible outcome for our children and our relationship with our children because we're kind of like are really talking about a lot of different things right if you kind of talk to your kid in one way my kid is going to be this heterosexual lawyer or da, 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 you know and then they don't fit that then they fail they just automatically fail so let's think about like what success would look like and success means like many things yes yes many 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 things um, some people are successful because they're still alive you know mm, that's absolutely little wins yeah so let us know what you think about that fantasy versus reality. Where's White that line? lies, truth, fantasy storytelling. White lies, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of that. Um, quite interesting. And I think, I guess, I really do think it's a conversation that's always going to be had, right? I guess it will shift. But we need to get to the beach. So, um, it was adios. Lovely talking to you. Adios, adios, adios. Ciao, hasta luego. <laughs> See you next time. Bye.